What's happening guys? Sam Adams here and welcome to a brand new episode of the Jam Pack Report today for September the 12th of 2019. Of course, for those that are brand new to the show, this is a daily gaming news podcast that keeps you up to date and informed on everything happening in the gaming industry. It's hosted on youtube.com slash Samuel Adams Media and then put up on podcast services around the world five days a week. I always have a good time and I hope you do as well. But today we are going to be talking about a ton of news coming out of the Tokyo Game Show, or even surrounding the Tokyo Game Show, because we have a Project Resistance trailer that shows off an overview of what you can expect from the gameplay in the new Resident Evil spinoff that we talked about earlier in the week. I must admit, not quite what I expected, and I'm not quite sure that I'm satisfied with it, but we will talk more about that in just a moment. Then, Electronic Arts is in the news yet again because of a response to DCMS calls for loot box regulation. That is, the UK government saying, hey, loot boxes, not good for kids. You should probably change that. And EA saying, but they make tons of money, though. Uh, that's pretty much the summary there. Then, Steam Indie Game sales are down by 70% as compared to last year, as estimated by one publisher. Now, that being said, again, highlight of the entire headline there, one publisher. This is not something that is conclusive, it's just something that we should probably talk about. Then, Control is getting some very interesting DLC. We will talk more about the expansions. Paladins and other high-res games are getting cross-play. Intel is hosting Olympic-sanctioned esports tournaments in 2020, and we have a ton of other news to dive into. It's a very jam-packed show that we have today on the Jam Pack Report. Ah, you see what I did there? I actually did it. But without further ado, let's go ahead and dive into today's top gaming news. First off, Project Resistance gets closed beta dates and an overview trailer from Capcom. Project Resistance is a 4v1 asymmetric multiplayer game in the Resident Evil series that will get a closed beta in October. After some testing and teasing in August, Capcom finally revealed 4v1 Resident Evil spinoff Project Resistance last week. Today, during Tokyo Game Show, we got more info about the game and an overview trailer. Capcom also confirmed that they will be holding a closed beta for Project Resistance in October for those interested in trying the new game, Resident Evil, out early. Check out the trailer for the game below, and of course you can check that out on YouTube, it runs about three minutes long, and I must admit, it's not looking too pretty at the moment, considering the fact that whenever you actually do uh, click on the YouTube video itself, the like to dislike ratio is currently 2.6k likes to 3.4k dislikes, uh, one of which I am. Uh, but. As many probably gathered from the previous trailer, Project Resistance is an asymmetric multiplayer game where four players cooperate to escape a building where everything is controlled by the mastermind, a fifth player, which is not something that I actually connected at the beginning of the tease. Uh, however, players on the survivor side can expect a gameplay mix of puzzle solving and combat similar to modern Resident Evil games, although matches are under a time limit. Meanwhile, the mastermind is placing traps, using security cameras as weapons, and manipulating the environment to make their opponents escape as hard as possible. This is done through a card-based system, and the Mastermind can eventually choose to control zombies or the tyrant. If you have ever played the multiplayer in Zombie U, that's the closest thing to compare this new game to. Pause. Let's take a little, a little break here from the Dual Shockers article. This is Dead by Daylight, but Resident Evil. Uh, even going further, it's closer akin to Evolve. Why would you compare it to Zombie U? Anyways, continuing, Project Resistance is being co-developed by Capcom and Neobards Entertainment, a company who has previously worked on the Nintendo Switch ports of Resident Evil games. The game runs on the RE Engine 2, so we can probably expect it to look very good. As I mentioned earlier in this article, a closed beta will be happening between October 4th and October 7th on PS4 and Xbox One, and it's only open to RE Ambassadors and Xbox Insider Program members, and you have to sign up on the game's website between today and September the 18th. Those at Tokyo Game Show this week will also have the chance to try out this game. You can see the latest screenshots for the new RE spinoff below, but Project Resistance does not have a release window at this time. However, of course, Dual Shockers and myself will keep you up to date and informed on what exactly is happening with the big new game. 
So as I talked about whenever the teaser was released, I was very excited about this game because Resident Evil has been on a roll for a very long time. Uh, Resident Evil 7 was kind of a new foray into an unexplored take on Resident Evil, and then we saw the remake of RE2, which is phenomenal. Highly recommend checking that one out. And so, of course, when the teaser dropped for whatever this one was going to be, I personally expected something akin to a Left 4 Dead 2, or even something along the lines of a Call of Duty Zombies, where you have that kind of setup going with it, and the trailer kind of lended itself to that idea. Uh, this, however, is not that whatsoever. As I said in the interruption, the, the uh, departure from the DualShockers article, this is essentially Dead by Daylight, and whenever you look at the gameplay, it does not look that good. It does not look that good at all. Uh, I will be the first to admit the lighting is good, the Resident Evil engine is clearly present here, but at the same time, I'm not sure if this is an early build, I'm not sure if this is just very early gameplay that they compiled for the Tokyo Game Show, uh, but it looks clunky to me, and it looks like it might not work out as well as the developers might hope. Now, I like the concept uh, where you do have a mastermind that is controlling things as four other players try to escape, but it's been done before by other companies with other settings, and I'm not sure that it works with Resident Evil. Now, I could be completely wrong about this, but this feels like this generation's Operation Raccoon City, and for those that don't know what that is, it was a horrendous, and I mean horrendous, uh, Resident Evil game that came out a couple of years back. I believe it's on the PS4 and the Xbox One, but I think it was one of those weird cross-gen titles. Uh, however, I just don't see this becoming the next big Resident Evil success uh, like we have seen in the past couple of years with different projects that have been spinning off. Is it too much to ask to just get a regular shooter in the Resident Evil universe, just a first-person zombie survival game? Game, that's a fantastic idea. That should have been done uh, well before whatever this is, in my opinion. But, again, I might not be the target demographic for this specific game. I've never been a big fan of Dead by Daylight. I'll play it from time to time. Uh, but considering the popularity of that game and the streamability of that game, which is something a lot of people have to take into consideration when developing games in 2019, this could be a sleeper hit that might just not be my cup of tea. I could totally see four people teaming up on a co-stream on Twitch uh, playing this. Maybe that would be some pretty good entertainment. Uh, but again, if you do want to dive into that closed beta, you should sign up now. And the closed beta dates run from the 4th of October until the 7th of October. And again, only open to RE Ambassadors and Xbox Insiders uh, if you did want to get inside the game a bit early. Uh, but, man... Uh, does not look good. And as we see in the comments section, number one, the number one upvoted comment, how many times do we have to teach you this lesson, old man? A good SpongeBob reference there is always good for the, uh, for the heart, for the soul. But that's pretty much what Project Resistance looks like as of right now. However, let's move on and talk about loot boxes, because Electronic Arts has responded to DCMS calls for loot box regulation. The publisher doesn't agree with conclusions, but will continue dialogue with the UK government. EA has responded to calls for the UK government to ban loot boxes in games for children and introduce regulation around the controversial monetization mechanic. In its report published earlier today, the DCMS committee also urged the government to introduce a games industry tax to investigate the harmful effects of gaming and push Peggy into adding gambling content warnings for games with loot boxes, raising the age limit to reflect this. In a statement issued to GI.biz, an Electronic Arts spokesperson said, quote, We have reviewed and are closely considering the findings of the DCMS committee report. While we don't agree with all the conclusions and recommendations in the report, we do take our responsibilities to players of all ages very seriously. We have an ongoing commitment to player safety and well-being whenever they are playing our games or engaging in our communities. We will continue to look at how we can contribute to productive research and solutions for the topics raised in this report, and we look forward to continuing our ongoing dialogue with the UK government. GamesIndustry.biz also reached out to Epic Games, Activision King, Ubisoft, Nintendo 2K Games, and Peggy about the government's recommendations. EA is one of the many games firms who was invited to take part in the committee's inquiry into immersive and addictive technology, but arguably struggled to justify its monetization mechanics in a way that satisfied MPs. The publisher even attempted to reposition them as surprise mechanics with Vice President for Legal Kerry Hopkins, assuring they are, quote, quite ethical. If you have to say something is quite ethical, 
it might not be ethical. Just something to consider. The controversy around loot boxes started with EA and the system it trialed with Star Wars Battlefront 2's multiplayer beta. The progression hindering dependence on loot boxes was later revised for the final game because the mechanic was dropped entirely just before launch. Paid loot boxes were fully removed from the game months later. The backlash against Star Wars' use of the mechanic and loot boxes in similar AAA games caught the attention of politicians around the world to the point where both Belgium and the Netherlands have banned them under gambling laws, forcing EA and other publishers to alter or remove their titles from those markets or change of course the uh, the gameplay themselves i suppose that would be included in alter or remove uh, however it looks like we have yet another nail in the coffin for loot boxes and i think as time goes on more people around the world will begin to adopt this kind of mindset where loot boxes just simply are something that aren't necessarily the best option for monetizing the game at the end of the day, though, they still make money, so people are going to be hanging on to these uh, for the longest time, because what is FIFA without a ton of microtransactions? What is NBA without a ton of randomized elements that you can throw your money at? Uh, that's pretty much the idea behind keeping these in the games. But it's good to see politicians taking a stance on this. I mean, uh, I believe the uh, DCMS over there overseas in the UK land is the Digital Commerce, uh, let's see, hold on, DCMS UK. I knew that it was something. Uh, department for Digital Culture, Media, and Sports. So this entire department in the UK government is devoted uh, to regulating this kind of thing, to addressing concerns uh, with this exact kind of issue. And so hopefully, as the discussion continues, Electronic Arts does respond favorably and removes them from the game. How long will it be until this is a worldwide thing? That's still up in the air yet to be decided. But at the same time, the conversation is beginning, which is a good step in the right direction. And of course, more to come on this one without a doubt. However, most indie games don't have loot boxes, which is why I'm a big fan of indies, amongst other reasons, such as they're often beautiful and full of passion. However, it looks like indie game sales are down by 70% as compared to last year, as estimated by a publisher. One publisher, so again, take this article with a grain of salt, but this individual has been pretty uh, activist-like when it comes to the rights of indie devs, especially when it comes to Epic Games Store and the surrounding issues. But according to new analysis, the environment for indie developers on Steam has gotten much more competitive over the last year alone, making it even harder to make money. Mike Rose, director at indie publisher No More Robots, has put together some estimates based on their years of experience, as well as Steam data. The goal is to find out how much money the average indie release makes in 2019 as compared to previous years. The document pulls data from public Steam figures such as review activity, group numbers, and other data points that include cross-referencing the information with other developers. Rose estimates around 900 games were released between July 5th and August the 6th, but not all of these games are being taken into consideration. First, the document takes out AAA games and games with less than 10 Steam user reviews. Out of the remainder, it further cuts out the top and bottom 5% so as to avoid outliers messing with the data. This leaves out around 170 games per to Rose's estimate. Out of that group, the average game sold 1,500 copies median this year, compared to 5,000 a year ago. As a result, the revenue has dropped from 30,000 to 16,000. The average price of these games has also dropped to $10 from $12. This is another point Rose emphasizes in their report. Game prices dictate how much money they make, but pricing games cheaper from the off doesn't actually bring in more revenue. The report found the games priced $10 or less sold 1,000 copies in their first year, compared to 2,500 copies for $16 to $20 games and 5,000 copies for games at $21 or higher. Quote, the average at least semi-marketed game on Steam currently makes roughly $16,000 in revenue across 1,500 units in its first year on sale, the report estimates. Games released in 2019 are making around half as much money as games released in 2018, and developers are pricing their games too low. Higher prices are, on average, resulting in better sales and much better revenues. Of course, there are several factors that cause this, among them the stark increase in competition thanks to an ever-growing number of Steam releases every month, the prevalence of free-to-play games and subscription services which can themselves devalue games even further. It's a depressing, if sobering, state of affairs. This is a big reason why smaller devs are happy to take Epic Games money to make their games exclusive to the Epic Games Store. I feel like I just read one of those old, like, elementary school uh, math things where it was like, if a train leaves Chicago at 10 miles an hour and another one leaves San Francisco, how many copies will Train Simulator 2019 actually sell by the end of the quarter? Uh, but regardless, 
still, I do think there is some validity to these findings. And of course, uh, for those that don't know Mike Rose, he is the one that has been pretty against everything G2A has been doing in the past, oh, I don't know, uh, since their existence. Uh, because he is the, of course, director at indie publisher No More Robots, famous for Descenders, a bike game that came out last year, I think. Uh, something like that. Uh, but overall, I think it's very interesting to see that these sales are down by 70%, at least if you have this very small uh, sample size of games released between July 5th and August the 6th, uh, there is still something to be said about comparing that to this time last year. Now, other elements have to be taken into consideration as well, uh, such as the new consoles coming down the pipe. Some people want to save money for the holiday season. Uh, of course, whenever it comes to the PC space, a bit different overall as compared to the console space. Uh, but sales are still down and I do think it has a lot to do with the competition because there are so many indie games and I speak from experience because whenever I first began doing the drop which is my series I put up on Sundays that shows off the games coming out on a week-to-week -week basis uh, I would have maybe between three and four games that I talk about on any given week and sometimes there would be months at a time where there was nothing significant enough coming out uh, that I needed to actually make an episode now on a weekly basis basis, I have to selectively choose which games I talk about because I don't want to have a 30 to 45 minute rundown of all of the games coming out on the weekly basis. There are so many of them. Uh, and so I think that definitely does cut into how many people actually go down and buy games. Uh, but the pricing point is also interesting as well. Because the average price of the games, as he found, uh, dropped to $10 from $12, which means people are selling their games cheaper in hopes to gain the attractiveness uh, in the eye of the consumer. And I don't think that's a very good mindset because, for instance, Risk of Rain 2, uh, an indie game that is kind of one of the top tier indie games, if you will, is priced currently on the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Switch, uh, yes, PS4, Xbox One, and Switch at $30, and then it's $20 on Steam. And I think that $20 to $30 price point is a pretty good sweet spot for a lot of gamers because that higher price, that not $5 to $10, proves that there is substance to this game, proves that there is something to be said about the quality of this game. The developers are confident enough to ask for $30, bucks, $20, bucks, whatever it might be. If a game comes out and launches at $10, I'm just not as interested because I immediately go to the idea of, well, this is probably a budget title with budget quality with budget gameplay, and that's not entirely true. Often it's not, but that's still what many people think, including myself, most of the time. So it's interesting to say the least to see this entire breakdown. Big kudos to Mike Rose for finding out the info uh, for the sample size of July 5th to August the 6th. It's a lot of games released in a short amount of time and a whole big difference as compared to last year's sales. But let's move on and talk about another game that came out during that time period, I think. Control, which I think came out after the 6th, but that's beside the point. It was the transition. It's part of the part of the thing that I do here on the podcast. Uh, but Control has detailed two big expansions, the first of which is a PS4 timed exclusive, but Alan Wake fans should certainly tune in. Control developer Remedy has detailed its plans for the game's post-launch content. Two paid expansions will arrive in 2020 with an in-game level challenges mode due first in December. The first of the paid expansions, The Foundation, will be a timed exclusive launch on the PS4. It's a detail buried in the press release and not in the studio's public blog post on the subject, which feels a bit sneaky. The season pass and individual expansions will be available for purchase on Xbox One and PC following the PlayStation 4 Expansion 1, the Foundation release, a line of small print reads. The All expansion will release on all platforms on the same day. Expect the Foundation in early 2020 and for the PS4 first, then before second expansion AWE arrives in mid-2020 at the same time for PS4, Xbox One, and PC. Both will be set in new locations within the game's oldest house locale and feature new missions and game mechanics. Peer closely at the artwork for the second expansion and you will see what looks a lot like a portion of the box art for Alan Wake. Very mysterious. Before all of that, Expeditions Mode launches in December to offer challenging new in-game content for free to all players, and even sooner, Control's Photo Mode will be accessible. But very exciting stuff to see that we do have an Alan Wake teaser uh, that could be coming to Control. Of course, I think these uh, worlds are very much so intertwined as we have seen revealed over the course of the past few weeks. There are teases as to what's going on within the world of Alan Wake, and of course, a lot is going on behind the scenes with that specific IP. 
Alan Wake, not done by a long shot. And I would say uh, that if it goes the way that I think Remedy hopes it goes, Alan Wake could be making a big comeback for the next generation, much to the pleasure of fans. Uh, people love Alan Wake, including myself. Uh, but we will see what happens with Control, one of the best-looking games of 2019, without a doubt. I mean, truly impressive. A patch was just released across all platforms to ensure the game continued to look as good as it possibly could if you do want to dive in and check it out. Again, the entire game is out right now on PS4, Xbox One, and PC, but more content is coming towards the beginning of 2020 and beyond if you did want to dive back into the world of Control. But you might want to dive into some high-res games in the meantime, because now they all support crossplay. Very exciting stuff. But right now, just Paladins with Smite and Realm Royale to come. You can now play with your PS4 and Xbox One friends. Paladins now supports crossplay between PC, PS4, and Xbox One with other high res studios games, Smite and Realm Royale, set to introduce the capability in the near future. It marks a small increase in the total amount of games that support play between all major platforms, with Sony's console lagging behind the Xbox One in terms of support. While Microsoft is famously willing, at least lately, to allow crossplay between platforms, Sony hasn't quite opened up as yet. Currently, the list of games supporting multiplayer between all devices includes Rocket League, Fortnite, and Dauntless, though in the coming months we will also see Call of Duty Modern Warfare join that list, as well as Smite and Realm Royale. That said, there are plenty of games that support crossplay between PC and PS4, but not Xbox, including DCU Online and Street Fighter V. Crossplay between Xbox, PS4, and PC, with Nintendo Switch where relevant, will roll out for Smite next week and for Realm Royale in early October. Uh, but Sony Chairman Sean Layden said in February that the company is open for business on the matter of crossplay, and that all it takes is for publishers and developers who wish to permission it. But some devs, including the CEO of Chucklefish, later chimed in to say it wasn't quite that simple. Sean is PC Gamer's Australian editor and news writer and did very well in this article that I began uh, to conclude and then move moved right into his description, which is why we're still talking about Mr. Mr. Sean. Uh, but I will say, glad to see more and more games getting crossplay support. It's always been a bit of a pain uh, when it comes to playing with friends on other platforms. That's something we can all relate to, and it's been fantastic uh, to see this movement where more and more developers and publishers are able to actually enable crossplay in their games. Uh, because growing up now would be a completely different gaming experience as compared to growing up uh, back whenever I was in 7th, 8th grade. Because I remember specifically framing my console purchase around where my friends were playing. I would focus specifically on getting as many of my friends as possible together and saying, okay, this is the year. I'm getting a PS3 or an Xbox 360 for Christmas. Which one should I play on? You've got your PS3 guys. You've got your Xbox 360 guys. It's always up in the air. People don't. Like, it, it's a hard decision. Now, it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, but... If you did want to dive into the high-res games, which essentially are, are kind of spinoffs of more mainstream games, like Realm Royale was kind of a take on Fortnite, uh, Paladins was whenever Overwatch came out, and then Smite, of course, is kind of like League, if I remember correctly. Uh, they're good games, they have little skews that do give them their own flavor, their own touch, uh, but at the end of the day, I mean... Hi-Res is kind of those repackaged, new, new, uh, new look kind of kind of companies. Uh, but that's beside the point. Good games all around, fun stuff, free to play, free to play. If you did want to dive in on the PS4, the Xbox One, or the PC, the Nintendo Switch were applicable and play with people across platforms over the coming months. Some even now. However, Intel is hosting an Olympics-sanctioned esports tournament in 2020. The competition will feature Street Fighter V and Rocket League for fans of those games. Gamers will go for the gold next summer in Tokyo, but not in the Olympics. Intel has announced it will host an esports tournament in Tokyo during the lead-up to the 2020 Olympics. Players will compete in Street Fighter V and Rocket League for a price of $250,000 for each game. Online qualifiers will kick off early next year with a live qualifier event in Poland in June. The final championship tournament Tournament, the Intel World Open will be held on June 22nd through the 24th in Tokyo. Similar to the Olympics, players will play on teams that represent their nations. A total of 12 nations will be pre-selected from the national teams. Beginning in March, national qualifiers will determine the best four players of each nation who will be selected to form that team. During the live qualifier in Poland, 20 teams will compete in a group stage qualifier to determine the strongest team in the Americas, EEMEA, Eastern Europe, the Middle East and Africa, and the Asia-Pacific region. The final seven teams will compete against Japan in the World Open in Tokyo. 
Intel will already have a big presence in the 2020 Olympics, bringing 3D athlete tracking, a 5G network, and a possible drone line show. Adding an esports tournament will only add to the American tech giant's cachet. Cachet? Cash? Something like that in Japan's capital city. That's a strange word to use there, but I mean, I get it. I understand the complexity of this. It's above my pay grade, though. Uh, but Intel getting in on the Olympics-related gaming events. Of course, there was talk for a long time about uh, esports and gaming being a big part of the Olympics themselves, but I don't think the world is quite ready for that. And so instead, Intel is putting on their own show that is uh, kind of alongside the Olympics, an accoutrement, if you will. And I will say, I think it's a pretty good move. It's a good move because I think that if you throw esports into the Olympics without proper preparation for the public to see esports in the Olympics, it will be ridiculed endlessly, and it will be like whenever esports comes up on ESPN or any kind of mainstream channel where you get the old people uh, that tweet and say, "Why are there games on my on my sports network? Why are you why are you shooting these people on CS:GO? What is CS:GO? I'm not familiar with this acronym." Like. It's ridiculous sometimes. However, glad to see the Olympics are beginning to be opened up a bit, even if it is not officially, with Intel definitely throwing a ton of money behind uh, some pretty big gaming titles to make a pretty big gaming show that will, without a doubt, uh, be on the world stage because, again, it is kind of uh, right alongside the Olympics and coming along at a very good time to do so. But again, if you are a fan of Street Fighter V or Rocket League, you better brush up because the online qualifiers will be here before you know it, and you could be in Poland, and then you could be in Tokyo. Could be an exciting time. Big year for you, if you're good enough. I know I'm not, but you could be. Uh, however, let's move on and talk about Ubisoft, because they don't plan on going back to the days of focused 15-hour Assassin's Creed's. Ubisoft is very happy with how its open world games perform, enough that it doesn't see a return to the old style of making these games. For the entirety of this generation and a bit towards the end of the last one, Ubisoft has been expanding its game worlds more and more with each game. This push-turn series, previously known for offering scripted experiences and bespoke worlds to these mega 100-hour games, whose worlds dwarf most others in the business. Franchises like Assassin's Creed, Watch Dogs, and now Ghost Recon have all caught the bug and more is yet to come. This isn't a new revelation, of course, and Ubisoft attests that this shift wasn't an accident. Our goal is to make sure you can have Assassin's Creed unity within an odyssey, Ubisoft CEO Yves Gemmo told Games Industry. If you want to have a story of 15 hours, you can have it, but you can also have other stories. You live in that world and you pursue what you want to pursue. You have an experience, many unity-like experiences. Asked bluntly if Ubisoft plans to return to that more focused format, Gimo simply answered no. In fact, the veteran CEO also believes this model is financially sustainable despite the constantly ballooning cost necessary to produce such massive games. It is sustainable because the world is big and the number of players that can play our games is immense. What we've seen in the last few years is the number of players that play our games is constantly growing, he added. New markets are opening up and games live a lot longer than before, so at the moment we see that we can continue to increase the investments because we know we can have a return on investment that can be quite long tail. The average Odyssey player spent 60 hours of game time in that world, which is more than previous games. This is partly why Gimo believes players are comfortable with spending money on microtransactions if it means getting more of that world. And so this is a very interesting article for me. Normally, I don't include these think pieces, these kind of background pieces in the daily gaming news, but I did want to comment on this because it's very interesting to see what Ubisoft has been doing. Uh, and mainly, the thing that amazes me the most is that they're correct. Assassin's Creed has become something of a worldwide phenomenon, even more so than in previous entries on previous generations, because of the long tail of the game itself. Assassin's Creed Odyssey continues to get DLC a very long time after its release. And I will say that the previous Assassin's Creed games, such as Assassin's Creed uh, Syndicate, such as Assassin's Creed, even going back to 3 uh, and those surrounding that, began to open the world up a good bit. Uh, but going back to Assassin's Creed 1, 2, uh, Revelations, those were very linear games. And you could get 60 hours of content out of one game if you did want to go through and collect everything. Uh, but to be able to have a full, fleshed-out world, to be able to explore, genuinely explore the game, is something that I think is 
is very Ubisoft uh, centric in 2019, very unique in 2019 because of the fact that they do it so well. Uh, now there are glitches, but overall Assassin's Creed Odyssey is phenomenal. Uh, one of the best Assassin's Creed games that I have ever played. And on top of that, uh, you see this kind of open world, open ended nature going into other games like, as they said, Ghost Recon, uh, Watch Dogs to a lesser extent for both of those games, but still included as well. But with that being taken into account, I do want to also say that there is something about the linear guided 15 hour game that I do miss. And these games are becoming fewer and fewer, especially in the AAA space. But as somebody who works between 50 and 60 hours a week, I don't have a lot of time to play games. I have some time to play games, but I don't have a ton. And I think that they do well with ensuring that you can, as Yizgomo says, get a 15-hour experience within this world that does include hundreds of hours of content, but to be able to sit down and completely veg out and just to be guided, guided along this adventure that features characters from Watch Dogs, Ghost Recon, Assassin's Creed, to kind of buckle in and have this interactive experience that is uh, easy to to follow that is a point-to-point -point kind of thing is something that I think is lost on this generation where we are so concerned with open worlds, with exploration, with new stories being told in every corner, every aspect of the game. Uh, I do miss that slightly, but I do understand the value of being able to take it chunks at a time, which is what I've begun to do, uh, where I do sit down and I'll play for a couple of hours at a time, getting small things done, and so it does spread out the game over the course of a few weeks. Regardless, that's just my take on it, but it looks like Ubisoft doesn't plan on going back to those games anytime soon. Now, let's move on to what I like to call the overall release date portion of the game, or at least today's podcast. Uh, but Yakuza 7 is now Yakuza Like a Dragon, coming west in 2020. Sega has revealed a change to the Yakuza 7 name in the west and a release target. And so we could read more about this. You can check it out yourself if you would like. Again, this is something that came out of the Tokyo Game Show. Uh, but it's coming out in 2020, first part of 2020. Specifically, it is going to be out on January the 12th in Japan and some point later in the year in the West on PS4. Uh, but the trailer shows off small of, uh, of course, the many games that Yakuza is famous for, including card racing, a rhythm game involving movie theaters, pachinko, as well as others. But Neo 2 launches in early 2020, as confirmed by TGS 2019's trailer. Neo 2 will launch for PS4, for PS4 in early 2020. Uh, publisher Koei Tecmo and developer Team Ninja announced. Team Ninja creative director Tom Lee also shared new info in a giant PlayStation blog post, which you can check out on, again, the PlayStation blog. That's blog.us.playstation.com, if I do remember correctly. Uh, but overall, if you did want to dive into the brutal blend of Japanese myth, legend, and history... Uh, that is going to be coming out in the first chunk of 2020, which is increasingly packed with more and more games, uh, to the point that I think it's going to be more overwhelming than the fall release season, which is already a pretty big piece of content to handle, or I should say big pieces of content to handle, rather. But then, if you are a fan of Final Fantasy VII Remake, there is a big Tokyo Game Show trailer that dropped showing off what pretty much people saw earlier in the year at Gamescom. Uh, but the Final Fantasy VII Remake looks just jaw-dropping from the latest trailer Square Enix has released for this week's Tokyo Game Show. And again, it is a pretty big chunk of content. Uh, they have a 2 minute and 50 second trailer, but there is a ton of gameplay uh, that many outlets have released online if you did want to check out uh, more in-depth combat style stuff, more in-depth uh, turn-based strategy, etc., etc. You can dive in and give it a deep dive on IGN. I know I watched the one on PlayStation Access, I believe I watched on YouTube last night at work when I should have been doing other things. Uh, but definitely exciting for Final Fantasy fans. I'm not quite a big FF VII guy, uh, a Final Fantasy VII guy, uh, but if you are, then by all means, you can dive in and check out tons of content that has been released akin alongside, uh, according to TGS 2019. But to round out today's show, Cuphead has a soundtrack that has been released, but guess what? It's number one on Billboard's jazz charts. For the better part of a century, the Billboard charts have plotted the course of our musical taste. The rules have changed many times over the years, reflecting the evolution of music and how we consume it, but even in this digital era, it remains a useful, indisputable measure of success. There are actually multiple Billboard charts. The Billboard 200 is the big one, but there are all kinds of genre-specific rankings too, including one for jazz, which at the moment is topped by the Cuphead selected tunes 
Tunes vinyl soundtrack. Composed by Christopher Madigan, the double album collection of music from the game debuted in the top spot and is the first video game soundtrack to achieve the mark. The original Cuphead soundtrack made it as high as number four on the jazz charts last year. The new soundtrack is also currently parked at number six on the vinyl albums chart just behind Queen's greatest hits. Hey, it's the vinyl charts. Time moves differently there. If you are a collector, the Cuphead double album soundtrack is available for purchase from IM8 Bid for 40 bucks. If you would just like to listen and it is really good, the original soundtrack is on Bandcamp if you did want to give it a listen. But very cool to see that it is on a Billboard top chart. Of course, Cuphead, fantastic in a lot of ways, but the music is phenomenal. The overall aesthetic of the game is something that cannot be understated. Really impressive uh, to see the music of Cuphead being heralded as a fantastic piece of art, which again, you can check out on vinyl or on digital fronts if you did want to give it a listen. But that rounds out today's episode of the Jam Pack Report. Again, if you are brand new to the show, thank you for giving it a listen, and I do hope you enjoyed what I brought to the table. I host this this podcast five days a week, Monday through Friday on youtube.com slash Samuel Adams Media. And of course, it is then put up on podcast services around the world. So subscribe. Be sure to follow me on Twitter. Stay up to date on everything that I do. But until the next time, I hope you guys have a fantastic rest of the day. I'll talk to you soon and peace.